Good morning. We're going to think about baptism today. What is baptism all about? It's a bit of a strange thing, isn't it? To watch somebody fully clothed go down and get dipped into a swimming pool or the sea or the river or something like that and then everybody claps and sings and, um, and loves it. Have you seen baptism before? Maybe you've seen hundreds and it's not that strange to you, but it does seem a little bit weird on the surface. So what is it all about? Well, it comes right in the middle of Jesus' Great Commission where he tells us to go and baptise people. Great Commission goes like this. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Starts with a big claim. Jesus is king of everything. Ends with a big promise. Jesus promises to be with us forever. And then in the, in the middle has three things to do. To go and make disciples. Teach people to be his apprentices. To walk with him and, uh, and enjoy him. To be baptised into him. Into the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And to teach teach them to obey everything he's commanded. We'll get to, to that soon. But today, baptising in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, I've got lots of stories. I've collected this week from different people. As I was talking to them about teaching on baptism this weekend, um, Rodri Darcy uh, shared one about his Tadki, his grandfather, who used to be a minister down in Pembrokeshire, and he was not a big man, five foot four or so, but the people in his congregation were often big farmers, big strapping lads, and so he had a trick to get them down into the water um, to baptise them. He would do a kind of judo move and kick their feet out from underneath them um, and, and dunk them down into the river and pull them back out again. That was his trick. Maybe shows us a little bit about helplessness. That's what baptism is about, about us being helpless before God, but how he brings us from death to life again. It's a kind of picture of that, down into the water, symbolising death, and up again to new life. We're helpless. He's the one who has to do the work. He makes us alive. Or another story I heard uh, about uh, is my father-in-law's, I think his great aunt, someone like that, who was baptised not far from here in South Wales, um, but in, baptised in January in an outdoor baptistry. <laughs> so they had to break through the ice, it was a cold January, break through the ice on that morning, pull all the ice out and then baptise them in frigid water. So imagine the commitment that would take to get baptised in frozen water. A commitment is what baptism is about, about us committing our lives to Jesus, committing our lives to, to worship God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, to belong to him. Baptism is a sign of our commitment and a sign of his commitment to us. Another way you could think about it is that baptism is um, it's a rebellious thing. It's a bit of a subversive act. So a story from China. Apparently in China at certain times, the government only let churches baptise on two days in the year. And they put a cap on the number of people you can baptise at one time. So, so you've got to get all of your baptisms onto one or two days and you can't have too many and they would have government officials sitting in the back checking off making sure that you didn't have too many and so how do you get around that a lot of people to baptize how do you get around the fact the government is sitting in the back of your church counting well this is apparently how they did it that it would take quite a while wouldn't it to get through 10 20 30 40 50 baptisms let's say they had a cap of about 100 it would take a, quite a while to get through to that number so somebody would sidle up to the policeman or government official and say Oh, this is going on, isn't it? Should we go outside and get a coffee? And so they would distract them, take them outside. You know, it's going to take a while. They're going to be here for a bit. We can come back later. And they would take them out for coffee, keep them there for as long as they could. And then they would ramp up the speed of the baptisms, get through as many as they possibly could and go way over the government quota. You see, you see, baptism in that way, it's a good picture of how, how we say Jesus is my king now. I don't care what other authorities there are in the world, they come second to Jesus. All authority belongs to him, and I belong to him. He is mine, and I am his, and I'm going to show the world. That's what baptism is. It's a public declaration that Jesus is king over me, that I've been, I've been put to death. The old me is gone, and I, I now have his name, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I belong to Jesus. He's my king. It's a subversive thing. It's a rebellious thing. Those are great pictures of what baptism is all about, but there's one other that I want to spend more time thinking about today, and that's the water. You see, whatever kind of baptism you've seen or practiced before, 
whether it's baptizing babies or baptizing believers as adults, whether it's sprinkling or dunking or whatever it is. I'm not really going to get into those debates today, I'm afraid. Sorry to disappoint you if you're hoping for that. Um, but water is the common thing. Isn't it common to all of those, whoever, you know, whatever age, whatever method, water is the thing that we use to baptize people. So what is that all about? Water is a significant thing in the Bible. So let's try and follow it through. Think of a few significant stories, events that involve water in the Bible and see how they connect to baptism because baptism is pointing us back to all of those big water events in scripture. Let me show that to you. If you haven't heard that before, if it's a bit strange idea. Okay, think of it, well, the first time we hear of water in the Bible is right in the beginning, in the creation story. That's what there is. It's just deep. It's deep, chaotic, dark water before the world is created. That's how it begins. And then out of that deep, out of that water, out of that chaos and darkness, God calls creation. His word goes out in the power of his spirit who's hovering over the deep and life land, light, living things begin to emerge from the water. So that's a picture of baptism, you see? From the dead, from the deep, from the chaos and the darkness comes new life, new creation. And God looks at it and he says, this is good. If you like, he looks at it and says, you are my world. You are my good world that I have created. But not long after that, it goes wrong. And the darkness seeps back into the world and, and Water becomes, through a lot of the scriptures, a picture of darkness, a picture of judgment, a picture of death. And so another story we might think of is the picture of the Exodus, the story of the people of Israel who, um, who are in slavery in Egypt, and then they're rescued by God, um, led by Moses through, do you remember, through the Red Sea, through water, and out into towards a new country, a new land, where they'll be with God, where he looks at them and he says, you are my people and I am your God. Let's live together in a new country, a new land. And it all starts by going through water. God rips apart, separates the Red Sea and the people walk through on dry land out to a new future. And then what happens behind them? This is really significant. Pharaoh and all of his armies, the people who've enslaved them, all of the enemies of God's free people, go into that sea and the sea covers them up again. They're drowned. They're gone. Those enemies are gone. The, in, the slave masters are dead, drowned, dunked deep in the sea, never to be seen again. And God's people are free. He looks at them and he says, you are my people and I'm your God. Or another event you could think about. Fast forward several thousand years to Jesus. Jesus goes into water, into the Jordan River. It's the same river that lots of other people have been going into to have their sins washed away, but Jesus never sinned. Jesus walks down into all of that water that kind of symbolically has all this sin swimming around in it and gets, gets plunged beneath it, down into that sin. And as he comes up, the heavens open and God speaks and says, this is my son whom I love with whom I'm well pleased. And he gives him his Holy Spirit. Do you know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of how later in Jesus's life, he would be plunged into the waters of death, into the waters of judgment at the cross. He would die. He would be drowned in the sea of our sin. He would take it away, drink it all down, be buried in the earth. But then three days later, the, the abyss, the grave, that watery, chaotic darkness would be ripped open again and life would emerge, Jesus would emerge in the resurrection. He really did live in his body, alive again, and, and took away all of our sins and gave us all new life. That is what a baptism is a picture of. Do you see? Baptism is all about our story being joined into that story. That's what the water is all about. It's about reminding us that if you belong to Jesus, then those stories are your story now. Your life, however chaotic and dark and watery it used to be, now it's new. God looks at you and says, you are my new world. It, it's the story of, of us being freed from slavery. All those things that we used to do that we kind of liked but were bitter in the end, that kept us enslaved and we, we didn't really want to do them, but we kept on doing them. And, and it was miserable. We were enslaved to those different things. Maybe you feel that still today. 
Jesus says, no, that can be over. That old you can be gone. Drowned into the, into the depths of the sea. Those demons, you know, we sometimes talk about that. I can't get rid of all those, all those demons. My personal demons. My history that hangs on to me. All those things that I've done, that people have done to me. And Jesus says, no, those can all be drowned. All those enemies, all those things that threaten to enslave you again. They can all be taken away, finished with. And you can walk into new life to be his people. He can look at you and say, you're my people. And I'm your God. And ultimately, Jesus' death is your story. And Jesus' resurrection is your story. That he looks at you now and says, if you're trusting Jesus, if you've been joined to him, if you've been baptized, then then the old you is dead. And the new you has been made alive. God looks at you and says, you are my son. You are my daughter, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit to live within us. Do you see the work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how you belong to him now? If you're somebody who's trusted him, that's what baptism means. All that watery stuff counts for you. You are a new creation. God looks at you and says, you're good, you're my world. You're free, you're my people. You are my son, forgiven and brought to new life. Isn't that really good news? That's really good news, isn't it? That's what baptism is all about, connecting your story with that story, whatever your history now you're free and your life is woven into woven into the story of god's redemption of how he brings new creation life freedom love from darkness sin death it's really good news that's what baptism is all about so three things to take away um that all begin with b baptism has something to say about your background baptism has something to say about your body Baptism has something to say about who you and where you belong. Before we get to those, let me read Romans chapter 6 to you. This is where all of this is coming from. Um, Well, lots of places in the Bible that we could go, but I want to read to you a bit of Romans chapter 6, just to show you that this isn't my own ideas. This is coming from um, from God in the Bible. Romans chapter 6 goes like this. What should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul's writing and he's saying... God has forgiven us of everything. We're free now. So how do we use that freedom? Do we just go and carry on sinning, kind of walking away from him like we used to live? He said, no, 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 by no means. We are those who've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Do you see what's happened to him has happened to you? Baptism is a picture of that. It's a seal of that. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Can you hear that story of the Exodus? A story of the Egyptian slave masters being drowned in the sea. They don't, they don't have authority over you anymore. Paul says, no, you shouldn't be slaves to sin any, anymore because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives... He lives to God, and now we live in him. 2 Corinthians 5.17, this famous verse says, if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's true for your background. Three Bs to take home in your back pocket. Your background can be transformed. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, you are new now. However much darkness there is, However much history there is, whatever has happened before, whatever they did to you, whatever you've done, you're no longer a slave. Whatever your habits have been, they can be broken and you can have a new life. Your background can be dealt with in Jesus. God looks at you and says, you're my new world, my new people, my son, resurrected. That begins now, begins in our hearts. He pours his Holy Spirit into us and makes it possible for us to kiss goodbye to the old 
old lives we used to live. And in his strength, not because there's anything good in us, not because we're better than anybody else, but in his strength, we can move on into a new future that your background can be dealt with. There's nothing too bad that you can't be made new in Jesus. Your body as well. Maybe you haven't thought about this much, but when you get baptised, it's all about your body, isn't it? It's not just your mind or your hands or something like that. It's your body that gets baptised. Your whole body. Our bodies are, are like the root of who we are, aren't they? Before we even realise that we exist, our bodies exist. When we're little babies, we don't know our names, we don't know how to speak. We don't know anything, we don't even know our hands belong to us and we wave them around crazily. When we're babies, we're physical bodies. Our bodies are the root of our identity. They are really fundamentally who we are. And baptism is all about God taking those bodies putting them to death, their old sinful bodies, and bringing them to new life, new bodies. That's what happened to Jesus, wasn't it? His body that belonged to this age was put to death and then he was raised in a new body, recognisable but right and bright and clothed in immortality and, and just different and yet also physical. He had a body and Paul said, we just read it, that we'll be raised just like him. God cares about your body. I mean, think of Jesus' salvation. It's all to do with his body, isn't it? He was born as a baby, that he was baptised in his body, that his body was whipped and beaten and spat upon, that his body was killed, that his body was resurrected. The whole of the story of salvation is all about Jesus' body. So do you know he cares about your body too? You know, our bodies are not just the sites of our identity, they're not just kind of the things that make us who we are and the family we're born into and the, um, the town and place and the names that we've been given, but, but they're also the site of, um, of our struggle and our sin, aren't they? That we feel shame deeply in our bodies and we want to hunch our shoulders and not look people in the eye. That we feel fear in our hearts and that our bodies tremble. That we feel guilt in our guts and our, our shoulders are way down and our eyes are cast down and our chins drop. And Jesus comes along and he says, no, don't be afraid. Lift up your head, lift up your hands. Don't be afraid anymore. I've clothed your shame. I've taken away that burden of guilt. Straighten up, stand up and walk with me and look forward to the day when these dusty bodies, even after they've gone back to the dust in death, look forward to the day when he remakes them, reclaims them brings them back to life and, and clothes us with immortality. See, Jesus really cares about your body. So whether your body has been violated or whether you've been the one doing the violating, whatever you feel in your body, whatever you've done in your body, it's old news. If you're joined to Jesus, the old is gone and the new has come and that includes your body. Baptised, washed and waiting to be raised in him. You see, baptism is a promise. It's a living, solid, true promise of what you'll one day be, dead but alive to new life, not just spiritually, but in your body as well. And the last thing, the last B, this is all about belonging, a belonging to a new community, a, a new city, a new city of people who are in harmony with each other, in harmony with our creation, in harmony with God, with the one that, that made you. A new community that's dedicated to serving God together. And we are together, aren't we? That God looks at us and says, you are my new world. You're part of it. The first bit of it begins in your hearts. You are my new people, not just individually, but together. You're my temple. You're my kingdom. You're my family. That's what the being baptised into the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit is all about, isn't it? I mean, whose surname do you have when you're born again, when your old you has died and the new you is raised up to new life? Whose surname do I have? Well, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, baptised into the name of God, where he is your father, where the Son redeems us and welcomes us and brings light and forgiveness into our lives, where the Spirit makes us live as an organic community. You see, we're a family united in the Father, a redeemed family united in the Son a living, organic family 
made alive by the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to live together. That's what Rose Dowsett says in her book on the Great Commission. She says, the disciples, we as disciples, don't travel alone. Or even alone in the company of God, you know, just between me and him. Disciples travel in a great crowd of fellow travellers, past and present, seen and unseen, near and far. The disciple community has the opportunity to demonstrate the communal life, life together, of just a different kind, different order, where self-centeredness gives way to loving service of others, where violence gives way to peace, where alienation gives way to reconciliation, greed to generosity, darkness to light, all by the transforming impact of the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism is all about. It's about how you've been, we've been, together as God's church through history, across countries brought together to have one Father, one Saviour, one Spirit who draws us together, who draws us to new life, who calls us out from slavery to freedom, who calls us towards hope in our bodies, who gives us forgiveness, who loves us together. And so we're supposed to be a community who lives this out together. That's why we get baptised in the big crowds. That's why we love it when we see people give up their old lives and come and join God's new community. It's a bit of a weird thing, baptism, isn't it? But isn't it beautiful? It's a sign of all that God has done for us and all that he's promised for us. And a seal, a seal on you that those promises will be true. That it's not just a picture. It's not just a kind of a symbol. It's not just something that we do because we're religious. No, it really is reality. God has washed your body. God has killed your body in Jesus and raised you to new life. So the old can be gone and the new can come. So are you a Christian already? Well, remember your baptism. That's who you are now, freed. God looks at you and says, you are good. You're part of my new world. You are free. You're one of my people and I'm your God. You are forgiven and I love you and want to give you my Holy Spirit and put you in a new community. Remember your baptism, that's who you are. When you struggle with doubts, when you struggle with temptations, when you're just not really sure who you are anymore, this is who you are. Baptised, brought into the family of God, part of, part of the family of Father, Son and Holy Spirit under King Jesus, given his spirit. That's who you are. Are you not a Christian? You're somebody who's, who's just not really sure about this yet? Well, I wonder if this, just take this home and think about, is this something that you want? Because it's something you're made for, to be new, not to live in a, in a dark and chaotic place far away from God, but to live in a new world, in a new kingdom, where God loves you and knows you by name and welcomes you into a community, a community that's supposed to be full of light, full of generosity, full of goodness. That's what the church should be. Would you like to be a part of that? It's what you were made for. Maybe you've got lots of questions. Maybe you've got lots of things you would uh, want to ask and talk through. Well, I'd love to talk to you about that more. Um, come and get in touch with me or with Sammy, with anybody at the church. Come along to one of our Sunday services. Get in touch with us online. We'd love to talk to you more about that. But I'm going to pray now. Maybe you could make this prayer. Uh, pray that, a prayer that, uh, that you echo in your own heart um, as you kind of make your journey and keep walking closer to God, the God who made you and calls you to new life in himself. Come on, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for, uh, for this good news that we can be part of your new world, your new people, your new creation, that this isn't just something that happens in our heads or in our hearts, but in our bodies too, that we can look forward to resurrection. Lord, we pray that you would help us, help us with our questions, help us with our doubts, um, help us with our struggles, help us with, Lord, with all the things that keep us from knowing you, from walking with you, from living as one of your people. We pray that you would help us to know you. And Lord, those of us who do know you, who've um, who've given our lives to you, who are new creations. Lord, if we're looking forward to baptism, we pray that you bring that day quickly. Uh, if we've been baptised, we pray that you would help us to remember our baptism, remember who we are in you, and look forward to the day when you'll take us home to be with you forever. Lord, we thank you for this really good news. We pray that you would help us to live it out in all that we do this week as your new people. Amen.